Online. So to hello to everybody on the panel and, jo and those joining us via Facebook Live. Welcome to the first Women of Color Leaders panel. My name is Dr. Salima Bimani, and I'm the founder of Relational Global Institute for Research, Consulting and Education. I will be moderating the dialogue. This panel is dedicated to women of color leaders in higher education examining the perils and possibilities of leadership. Our goal is to bring forward the experiences that are least heard, misheard, and undervalued. And therefore today we focus especially on how race and gender structure leadership experiences. The Women of Color Leadership Series is part of Relational's mandate as a global platform for dialogue on issues of social justice, equity, and inclusion. Relational is an institute that I founded in 2016 to advance equity, social justice, and inclusion within institutions and with communities in the USA and Canada. Relational's vision is also to build original, socially innovative programming that meets the needs of women of color and other social minority communities. And so over the next year, we're gonna be rolling out various leadership programs and research projects. So stay tuned for that. And we love expanding our network and building our community. So if you're interested in partnering with us, I encourage you to go to our website that's www.iamrelational.com, and let's set up a time to chat. Shirley Ann Jackson, Dr. Ruth J. Simmons. These were the first African-American presidents in higher education institutions in the USA, appointed in 1999 and 2000. Let's pause and take that in. These women broke the glass ceiling and also made a hole in the race wall that serves as a barrier to women of color's horizontal movement. That is in their everyday relationships, experiences, access, and opportunity. Although these women serve as beacons of inspiration and resilience, they arrived in the highest places of leadership within higher education. Their experience of getting there is perhaps even more relevant to us today. Once arrived, then what? In historically white educational institutions, Leadership has been implicitly and explicitly structured, embodied, designed, and expressed through predominantly white men. So even with the achievement of these extraordinary women, the reality is women of color leaders in higher education are far and few between. The statistics provide a snapshot. 26% of institutional leaders in all higher education institutions in the USA are women. Of that, 11.2% are African-American, 5.5% are Hispanic, 3.5% are Asian, 0.1% are Pacific Islander, 0.5% are Native and Indigenous, and 0.8% are mixed race. In Canada, the overall statistics for women in leadership positions are more promising, with 41.4% of women in leadership positions, but only 19.6% of those are women of color or visible minority, and there's no breakdown by race. So there is an issue of women having access to enter leadership positions. Research shows that women of color who do make their way into administrative positions often come through the faculty pipeline. This then also presents a problem, as women of color face serious barriers to achieving faculty positions in general, let alone positions that are tenure-tracked. As there is encouragement for people of color and women of color to be in leadership positions in higher ed, particularly through diversity and inclusion efforts, they find themselves coming in with their racial identities highlighted as part and parcel of the diversification project. And yet, as they arrive and live out their leadership positions, their experience is obscured through race-blind or race-neutral conceptions of leadership and what leadership means, the expectations, how leadership happens and how it should be expressed. Given that cultural and systemic changes are incredibly slow in higher ed institutions, women of color in these positions continue to operate within historical cultures and structures that have been predominantly defined by dominant bodies. Paradigms and practices of leadership neither acknowledge nor understand racial, gender, or other differences through which power relationships are embedded in the very spiky and structures of historically white serving educational institutions. So for us, the question is not simply how do more women of color gain entry into leadership positions? 
but what do we need to expose, understand, and transform so that the conditions of leadership are different for women of color leaders and that they are fully resourced, seen, respected, valued, and supported. If you are a woman of color in higher education and in a leadership position, you are the few, the first, and the only. And in that sense, I can't emphasize enough what a privilege and honor it is to have the women of color leaders on this panel that we do. They are the few, the first, and the only. We have six exceptional leaders on this panel today. Given the extraordinary accomplishment of each of these women, we would run out of time if I was to give their full biography here. However, we will post them on our site and on Facebook. For now, let me briefly introduce this esteemed panel. Dean Pamela Sudeman of the Faculty of Arts at Ryerson University, Toronto, Canada, has in the past served as president of the Canadian Sociological Association. She was also chair of the Department of Sociology at Ryerson and dean of the Faculty of Arts, and now is the dean of Faculty of Arts at Ryerson University in Toronto, Canada. She recognized her role as a leadership right from the start of being a junior faculty member, and since then feels greatly responsible for bringing forward the voices and stories of cultural and racial communities. Dr. Candy S. McCorkle, Director of Diversity and Inclusion at Alma College, Alma, Michigan. She has served both as faculty and administrator. Her doctoral dissertation examined the experiences of first-generation African-American students at predominantly white liberal arts colleges. After hearing the narratives of these students, she saw the need to continue to work in higher education and to promote diversity and inclusion, and this is what's brought her to her current role. Dr. Kiara Hensley, Assistant Vice President for Academic and Student Affairs at Eastern Michigan University. She, reserved her, she received her doctoral degree in higher education leadership and administration. She has served as ombuds for Eastern Michigan University and also served as program coordinator and diversity coordinator at other institutions. She is passionate about issues of economic, gender, education, race, equity, and inclusion. Her service and professional work focuses on the development of women, institutions, individuals, and communities of color. Dr. Manal Hamze is Associate Professor, Department of Interdisciplinary Studies and Women's Studies Program at New Mexico State University. She holds a PhD in critical pedagogy. Dr. Manal is serving as a member at the NMSU's Institutional Review Board, a senator on the NMSU Faculty Senate, and a member of a university-wide faculty affairs committee. He's also served as a member of the NMSU's Diversity Council and Presidential Building Division Committee to Craft Diversity Goals. Lucy L. Sharif is a PhD candidate in the Collaborative Graduate Program in Ethnic and Pluralism Studies. Her research interests include how Arabs and Muslims in North America learn and challenge understandings of citizenship and belonging through nation and land. She also examines Orientalism, settler colonialism, and how racially linked logics strengthen each other. Lucy has also been organizing panels, one I had a privilege of being on, and brings forward the voices of Muslim and Arab educators, activists, and community members, and I think situates it really well in the field of education. So thank you all for coming. Again, we're really privileged and honored to have you here. So let's just start, let's just get right into the conversation. Um, the first question that you know I really wanted us to start with was really this question of how does race and gender structure the experiences of leadership in your own experience? Why don't we start with um, Candy, if you're okay with that? Sure. Uh, well, for me, uh, it seems I entered uh, the professoriate at the age of 26. It was my first full-time uh, professorship. And I ended up in an institution in which I was the only faculty of any color. Um, and just by happenstance, that threw me into a position of having to be a voice. Um, and it's been very interesting because whatever I did or said, I always felt the need to have to justify or explain it. Um, um, I always wore a kente stole with my regalia for example, and I was questioned by white colleagues as to why are you wearing that? That's not academic. And it is uh, because for me, it was uh, something given to me by the faculty of my undergrad institution. 
to represent that my accomplishments academically were not just those of my own, but those of my race. So it went beyond just mine. Um, I cut my hair when I had my first child and I came back to work and everyone thought I was now a militant uh, and it was more of a convenience factor. And even when I bring certain things to uh, the table, when we're talking about, especially when we're looking at students and programming and curriculum, and we start to talk about certain students and certain students' behaviors, instead of looking at how we might be approaching our own instructional, you know, we tend to teach in a very, you know, monolithic way, one way, not thinking about all those different students in our class. And so when I would um, suggest that we um, kind of diversify how we teach, people would react um, because a black woman said the word diversity. So it must mean that I need to now talk differently or do things differently. And I'm just talking about the approach that you're taking because students, regardless of their color, are very different than we were when we were students. And so we have to enter the classroom very differently. And so I think for me, race structures a lot of how my path has happened. I've had to be very cognizant of how people are perceiving me. Um, I've always had to be very clear in what I mean. Um, and I'm often put into positions not by choice, but because usually I am one of a, a few uh, people of color in most of the institutions I've worked that I end up on committees or in positions that are not necessarily my job, but you're going to become the expert because you're the one that looks different. Um, so race has structured very much the experiences I've had uh, because I've tended to work in predominantly white uh, institutions, usually small liberal arts colleges. So constantly, you know, even with students, Many of them have never had to interact with an African-American woman as a person of authority. Uh, and so I have challenges in the classroom that I'm sure a white male counterpart would not have in the classroom. Uh, and so having to figure out how do I navigate that? Uh, so race has very much structured my experiences in not only leadership, but just in my path in academia. Mm, thanks, Candy. Does anybody else want to jump in? Go ahead. It's that's okay. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, I came to the U.S. Uh, as uh, the Iraqi army, I mean, the American army went through Jordan, my home country, to go and invade Iraq in 2003. And I came in 2004 to the U.S. on this borderland and between Mexico, New Mexico, and Texas to do my PhD. From that moment, uh, Islamophobia and anti-Arab racism shaped my experience at the beginning as a student in social justice education and uh, and later on as a, as a professor. It, that also um, um, sort of forced me to focus my dissertation study uh, um, to understand the experiences of Muslim young girls in this region with the, um, the racism directed against them as uh, visibly, mostly uh, uh, Muslim young girls. And then uh, that took me to uh, get into the tenure track a process where I was looked at as really ambiguously white rather than uh, a woman of color, especially when my um, uh, alliances with Chanas here in this region was, they were developing and becoming more and more powerful and visible and mostly I would be questioned by the white liberal feminist even in my department as uh, gender and sexuality so um, in the, the era that we are living in which is uh, the war on terror and terrorism has shaped my um, uh, experiences in relation to race and gender and so every Every bit of my scholarship, my pedagogy, and, and now the attempts to take on leadership positions is shaped by that context, yeah. especially because it's very, very much connected to the historic um, colonial uh, racist um, history of this borderland, which is reflected so much in the uh, institution we are in that mainly is uh, a Hispanic serving institute, but it's like, it's white uh, and a very much um, 
very much col colonial um, imperial higher institution, higher, higher education institution. Mm -hmm. I mean, both of what I hear both you and Candy saying is that there's no escaping one's racial identity when it comes to doing this work. It's just you are going to be read. And, and there's complicated layers to how one gets read racially, but that's inevitable. Um, somebody else want to jump in? How about Pam? How about yourself? I mean, given that Canadian context, we've heard from Candy and Manal who are speaking more to the American context. Just to speak to the point you made, Salima, about um, no escaping your racial um, identity and the way in which you're identified as a racialized woman. Um, when, in my early years of teaching, uh, I used to teach very large classes and um, sometimes you know, after class you hear conversations on the part of uh, students and um, often I don't, most often I don't want to hear because they don't know I'm, I'm in hearing range. Uh, but I heard one student say to the other, oh, how was the class? And that was my class. And the other one said, oh, it was okay. You know, she's a Chinese lady. Um, so uh, it impressed upon me what, well, I guess I had already known that um, I'm identified first uh, by racial um, character, what people perceive as a certain racial identity. Um, also, it's often inaccurate because I'm of Japanese descent. <laughs> And um, they also used the word lady uh, to describe their professor and, you know, really said on my course outline doctor, Sugaman. Um, yeah. no, so um, certainly race, race uh, shapes uh, leadership, experiences of leadership. And I think when you're at the front of a classroom, you are in a position of leadership. And um, I've always said, like it or not, teaching hundreds of students, I uh, became uh, a leader. Uh, my family is of Japanese descent, uh, but I'm third generation uh, in Canada. And my parents and my grandparents were interned uh, during the Second World War, even though they were Canadian citizens. Uh, landed immigrants on the part of my, uh, my grandparents. Uh, so uh, that's been uh, a propelling force. I mean, the fact that of this injustice against my family it really made me feel as though I had no choice um, as an academic uh, to, but to speak up. Um, I, I, I think in some ways, um, in spite of that past, I entered a leadership role, and at the same time, because of it, I entered a leadership role. Um, in spite of it, because a monologue just is not um, something that I was ever comfortable with. Um, as Japanese Canadians, as you know, racialized people, as people who were um, overtly and otherwise discriminated against uh, in this country, uh, we tried very hard to become invisible. Um, our parents, all, most of them, tried uh, hard for us to assimilate, and by assimilation, then that, that meant blending in. Uh, so, so leadership has, uh, because of that history of racial injustice and uh, for some traumatization, has really uh, become, you know, taken on a very different form and meaning to me. So how do you navigate that now, Pam, being in the, as a dean of, a, of the Faculty of Arts? I think this is this is the moment. Uh, I think uh, certainly within Canadian society, within my institution, Ryerson University, uh, within my personal life, this is the moment to uh, to seize um, because uh, it's the time uh, for us when equity, diversity, and inclusion um, is very topical. Uh, so it has become more legitimate, and it has been given legitimacy by a lot of people, not, not uh, people beyond my own circle. And uh, so I, I think that um, you know it's my responsibility to be, become part of that uh, that dialogue, that conversation. And the way in which I can do that is by redefining leadership, uh, so that um, I can, in my own quiet way, and maybe with some quiet confidence. Uh, be a leader, and um, I, I think that that acceptance is very important, even if it's self-acceptance and, and it goes out more broadly than that. Um, that leadership doesn't have to be loud, and it doesn't have to be about being able to talk in paragraphs. Um, and 
means it means, uh, has a lot to do with listening as well. Thanks, Pam. Kara or Lucy, do you want to jump in? Um, I really like um, how uh, Pam ended, so I think I'm going to segue from that if that's okay. Um, so when I think in terms of um, leadership not being loud, the way that I see it is um, through doing the kind of research that I think is necessary that I don't see being done. Um, and as a woman of color, I'm very white passing, I think, and that's how the world seems to perceive me right now. Previously, I used to wear the hijab and my experiences. But in terms of right now and being a PhD candidate and um, doing the research that I'm doing, I find that it's, it's very hard to find faculty members that are women of color to connect with, um, learn from, and gain mentorship from. Um, and that's something that doesn't affect other people in my department to the same degree because there's uh, more than sufficient representation for along racial lines. Um, there is a particular situation related to the Muslim ban that is affecting me right now that isn't affecting other people in the same way. And um, they think they get it important, I, I would have to argue at a symbolic level, but at a, at a, at a grassroots level, at a down-to-earth level, it doesn't re deal with the real problem I have of how am I going to continue to do the work that I do within the current climate? How am I going to continue to have conversations across borders important to my career? Um, I'm basically thinking this through on my own. Um, and the kind of recognition or understanding that would come if being a woman of color was not such a minority or being a person of color in academia was not such a minority, I find is something that's uh, um, very much structured along racial lines and very much something that I have to keep explaining over and over because they're not getting it in the same way. Um, I think it's a really good analogy also for, for seeing how it's a microcosm for how it plays out in the wider public. Um, in the sense that we had a, a, a parliamentarian in Canada who tried to pass a motion in Parliament around the Muslim ba uh, brand Islamophobia after the shooting that happened, the tragic shooting that happened in Quebec. Um, and everyone in Parliament was up in uproar. Um, and I think this kind of speaks to the kind of climate one faces that even a symbolic level sometimes you can't get that kind of understanding and recognition. So the statement goes out um, and that's really the end of it. Um, and finding the kind of support that's necessary um, is really a challenge. And um, yeah, <laughs> it's a good, the Muslim ban is a good example of that at the current moment. Thanks, Lucy, for that. I mean, I think you know, if I go back to what Candy was talking about, I think I think each of you are actually making some really important points around really the the historical um, connections. You know, whether it's sort of the, the African African American experience in the United States of race and racism, um, broadly speaking, and then within the institution of higher education, whether it's you know Muslims or Arabs or whether it's Japanese women or whether the Japanese community in Canada. I mean, there's no way to not make connections back with what's happening in higher ed to the broader context. And I think that that kind of analysis is really, really important. And that's the analysis that, that needs to be brought back into higher ed so that we can think of you know leadership differently. Kiara, we'd love to hear from you on this as well. Uh, well, I would agree with uh, Dr. McCorkle that race has not only structured my experiences as a leader, but most certainly from early as I can remember my experience of being with school. Uh, and I mean, from probably first grade, right? Uh, I was, and I think the main piece of, of what I'm hearing from everyone too is this sort of hyper awareness. One of, I think, the really common experiences is you become, you know, hyper aware of your how, how you're perceived. Um, how to advance collaboration when there is when there are so many sort of biases and privileges sort of between you um, to get the work done, you really have to move beyond 
sort of the the challenges and the hyper awarenesses to get to a point of collaboration with people and developing people beyond the experience, you know. Um, So one piece for me is that, is that hyper-awareness that of, of perception of how to collaborate with people who I know have specific beliefs and, you know, uh, biases even, um, and in some cases, flat-out bigotry, you know. Uh, those are really, you get tired of being hyper-aware. It's a very exhausting sort of situation, yet it is exactly what you sort of develop a passion to do. Um, so I think somebody else said it earlier, it was sort of like, the, it's a double-edged sword, you know, it's, it's a painful thing, but at the same time, it's also the thing that you really enjoy working hard at to change. Um, I think another really important dimension is, is the actual movement. You know, when you brought up the first data, so, you know, about the two presidents, two, I mean, that's phenomenal. It's a fun, and then 1999, I think you said, 2004. I mean, that's really, I, that's something I think you have to ponder for a while, like I'm still sitting on that a bit. But I do believe that there are some very significant deficiencies with the way the system allows women of color to excel. And I think one of them is financially. We know that that's, you, you know, we're just not paid for in par, right? Uh, I think that's one, and I think it's very, very, very difficult to ignore the fact that, you know, we're a class of women that are underpaid in extraordinary ways, yet we contribute so much. Um, so I think, you know, negotiating, um, taking advantage of sort of that type of leader, I think, is something that institutions commonly do. Uh, because you end up being the token person. I mean, that is, we are still at a stage where we are token people. Um, and we're fighting against that. It's constantly a part of where, where we are. Um, and trying to really move an institution to away from that type of model. You know, we had a Eastern racial, um, you know, a protest around the racial incidents happening, you know, across the world, in the country, and across the world. But... I thought some of the demands that were made of the institution, we could have responded to better. But instead, we responded to them in a very traditional context of, here's the token people we're gonna, they're going to speak to. And I'm thinking they're demanding something much deeper. So how do we get institutions to get to that deeper point? Um, those are the ways in which it, it, race really structures how I go about my work. Um, and how I think about my feelings. It's hard sometimes to work in situations where you feel like you really can't advance people. So to continue to work to advance people, um, I think, uh, you know, is, is, a, is a challenge that women of color in particular uh, struggle with, you know, maybe more so than others. But that is a very critical part. I also find that there are so few of us that if we don't, I don't see how higher ed can, can rebuild itself if we're not present and very active in this context, you, you, you cannot be, there's no compartmentalizing being a woman of color for me. It is a part of every fabric of my being. I, everything that I do is sort of, you know, is influenced by that, by some lens of that. And as, in terms of the intersectionality, all I'll say about that is that also is just not compartmentalized. Um, I have come across and I, in, in my work with students, my school with students and in institutions, is the, the intersectionality piece, we don't get well at all as an institution among us. So, Thanks, there's Sarah. lots of work to be done there. Yeah, I mean, I think I think one of the things that you're pointing on, I think all of you on some level are pointing out the paradox, right? That, that as women of color leaders, you live a paradox. Because on the one hand, it's like you just want to be seen as an individual who's doing amazing work, who's got X qualifications, who's there, who's worked hard to be there. And then at the same time, you know, taking on the identity of being one of color, whatever, you know, however one identifies in that spectrum, um, because we don't necessarily have a choice not to, given the fact that we continue to be 
judged and you know put in a position where our racial identity is at the forefront our, our gender identity is at the forefront um and so i guess one of the questions that i had building on that and this idea of the paradox is what are the limits of being in a leadership position for you as women of color like what do you come up against and you're like Ugh, can't get beyond this you know um then what are the possibilities and i think it's really important to talk about the limits because and then when you talk to other women of color too, they'll be like, yes, it's great, come come into leadership positions. But the reality is we are up against stuff and I'd like us to kind of tease some of that out for, for people. I think for me, that's a loaded question as to what are we up against? We are up against a lot. And I think it goes back to uh, perception. Uh, we are challenged with changing perceptions at the same time, I think, being true to who we are. And that becomes a challenge. Um, I often wonder what mask am I wearing today when I go into meetings? Because um, if I say what I'm really thinking, I probably will walk out without a job. And so yeah, right. I have to find a way to engage uh, you know, diplomatically, but at the same time being honest. And I think that's something that I think we're up against is when I look at my white male counterparts, they have a greater freedom to speak what they think and feel than I do. Um, I had a, an example at an institution I served previously as an honors dean in which I had a male counterpart who often used profanity in meetings, was not always very polite to colleagues. Uh, and I sent an email to him, I'd asked him for something, he sent me back a soliloquy instead of a simple answer. And I just said, you know, a simple no would have been sufficient. And he found that offensive. Uh, and so um, squawked about it and um, our provost said, well, you know, maybe you weren't so polite to him. Again. Or, or your directness can be seen as rude. And, and I think of my directness as making sure you understand what I mean, so there's no misunderstandings. But a male could be equally direct, and his is seen as you know very strong, very articulate. Mine is seen as rude and um, offstandish. Uh, and so it's that perception, both I think as an African-American and as a woman. As a woman, I am to be, uh, I think, more gentle and and that's not my personality but that's the perception so i fight against that i also fight against as an african-american sometimes it's you know the sense of you know how dare you be at this table when i've earned the the same you know academic accolades i've done the same scholarship so i have equal right to be at that table but yet i have to go a step further to prove why i'm at that table I think that's something that we're against, uh, up against as women of color, moving further up that uh, leadership ladder. And Pam made a comment that I wanted to speak to, and it is about leadership not being loud and you know clanging uh, gongs. I always tell people leadership is not about holding a position. Um, that's a type of being a leader, but it's not about holding a position. It's about using the position you're in, whatever it is, to empower others, to encourage others, and I think even as tiring as this work is, one of the things that we're able to do is the more we continue to come back and come back and come back uh, and engage, we force change because we teach people how to interact with us. And so that then creates kind of this, like a mobile, it causes uh, indirect change. And I think that helps women who are coming after us. It helps the men who are coming after us. It also helps our contemporaries in that the more we continue to keep our presence, it forces change because we engage. And so I, I do think we come up against um, trying to challenge the male perception of leadership uh, because as Pam stated, leadership comes in lots of different ways. Uh, and we all are leaders without holding a particular position of leadership, but just in by engaging in what we do. Uh, makes us leaders. And I think what we come up against is uh, perceptions about who we are as women, perceptions about who we are of people of color, um, which are often misconceptions 
but to challenge those misconceptions and, and, you know, teach people how to interact with us, how to accept our approach to leadership. Um, and it, it does get tiring. Uh, it, it does. But I think we each have a resilience. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't do this work. Uh, we would easily, as Pam said, her uh, ancestor did just to try and become invisible. I think we've decided no longer will we become invisible. Uh, we will be seen, we will be heard, we will be appreciated. Um, and I think that requires resilience. You know, when you, when you, Pam, when you have that moment of hitting that, hitting the barrier, hitting the block, hitting the wall, what's your internal conversation with yourself? Because I think we all have it. <laughs> we're all talking about like, how are we going to, so what's like, a, can you give us an example of an internal conversation that you have with yourself to say, yeah, I got to get through this? Well, I, I think um, you hit so many barriers, um, uh, so many blocks, so many roadblocks. Uh, you then uh, run into a student, you know, an undergraduate student or a graduate student who says, I think you're doing some really great things. I'm really glad that uh, you're in this position, that you're providing leadership. Um, I want to do things too. I want to um, become whatever, a lawyer, or I want to become a, you know, be at an activist within the community. That's really, really inspiring. Um, you hit blocks and then you go out and um, meet a, um, someone externally in the community who says that, um, you know, uh, they can offer students some placements um, in a, um, you know, uh, so that they can do social justice work. Um, you need students in an institute for change leaders. Um, you know, I think the students really, the students um, really inspire. And it, it's, as, as, um, as Candy was mentioning, it's exhausting. Um, and resilience is absolutely essential in this kind of position. Exhausting not only because you are um, expected to represent women or, and or uh, people of color on various committees and uh, you know, be the, the spokesperson, but exhausting also because you have your own agenda as a woman of color. Um, you want to advance certain causes and that uh, is also really, really rewarding. Um, so, I mean, that you, as, as um, a leader uh, in a formal leadership role, uh, you have some power, uh, not uh, power without constraints, I mean, or restrictions, but you do have some power uh, to make some changes. And I think that's, uh, that sort of feeds the, um, the soul and, and, and the body. Um, and uh, it's really important. I mean, universities are, I feel, uh, extremely, I mean, people talk about the difficulties in the private sector and corporate Canada, corporate America, and certainly they're very real. But universities uh, are uh, also uh, very difficult structures in which to make change because they're uh, hierarchical as well as we all know uh, they are uh, based on meritocracy um, and when you think about um, decisions around tenure uh, recruitment hiring uh, promotion um, the racism and the sexism in and i think this is true of every university in both canada and the states I mean, they they really do still uh, shape our decisions, and I think we really have to be conscious of, um, you know, what a, uh, the importance of a refereed article versus um, activism in the community, and the value of different sorts of activities and contributions. And I, you know, I have to catch myself as well um, and think about the biases that I may have um, as someone who's grown up in this system in, in the academic world. So those are the, some of many uh, limitations. I mean, I love what uh, Candy. I think you, you were. I think the thing that you said about resilience. You know, I feel like that's probably the internal conversation. Right, keep going, keep going, keep going. And when you hit, when they hit those blocks, and Pam, I hear you saying the same thing, right? You hit those blocks, and you're like, yeah, gotta keep going, gotta keep going, because it's not just about me. There's, there is a, there is a um, responsibility and accountability to other people. 
to other women of color, to other people of color, to other people, marginalized people who are in this institution. Kiara, did you want to jump in? Uh, I was just thinking in terms of the possibilities. The one thing that I think that sustains me the most through my life experience at this point, which includes all my career work, is that I continue to sharpen my resilience. I am constantly learning that I am more resilient than I think I am, that I am stronger than I think I am, <laughs> um, that I'm worthy of sitting at the table, and that I am worthy of, you know, I'm learning to love myself, that that's in spite of a world that tells you and treats you like you shouldn't love yourself, right? And that you're not worthy. And I think, so for me, that constant challenge, that's a possibility, the challenge of resilience and growing in the game. Also, grit. I do think that grit is, you know, it's a part of resilience that has a little more something um, to it. But that grit, I do, if you sharpen it, right? You really hone your capacity to take on life in the world a successful, constructive way, a positive way. Um, but I do think there are some limitations, and, and I think it, the limits of, of the work we include really, you know, you got to be careful not to lose yourself. Self-care is important. Um, for me, the stress of constant things that you're hearing from the panel members, you know, I started to eat myself I'm an eater, I'm a foodie, I like food. But I uh, really started to develop bad self-care, right? And as a woman of color, I can't say I was ever particularly good at it, right? I was, I'm always good at nurturing others, but never myself. But I think this work in particular, you have to be, to, to, to live in a state of, you know, hyper-awareness and hyper-sensitivity and constant forward movement, you gotta be healthy and happy. And so the limits of this work for me include that you can really be burnt out quickly. You can really be dragged into lower self-type conversations, if that makes sense. Uh, meaning, you know, if you're not careful in higher ed, you're quick to get into methods that really have nothing to do with you. There are other people kind of drama. Um, so, you know, you got to take care of yourself. And so the limits... I think they're important to recognize within yourself what each of them, you know, what they are for you. But for me, it's being conscious of who I am, actually, and working to stay in a clear state of mind, to stay healthy, hydrated, uh, so that you can keep the stress level down because the stress is high. And then when the stress is high, your cortisol goes up and health has become an issue. And as women of color, we often have, you know, genetic issues. Like, right, related to health, right, and hereditary issues. Um, so, you know, it's a, it, to me, again, it's that part of not looking at ourselves in a compartmentalized way that I think, you know, looking in higher ed, you can very quickly compartmentalize yourself and your life. Uh, you have to be very careful not to do that. But there are a lot of wonderful possibilities, I think, and really some strengthening and empowering things uh, that are challenging, but really allow you to grow as a woman um, and as a contributor of a, of a woman of color. I think it's really important for me. I love what you're saying, Kara, because you kind of flipped the question. You said, what are my own limits, right? So it's not just like, what are the limits that the institution sets for me, but what are my own limits? And, and recognizing that in order to do, continue to do this work and, and not just survive, but thrive in it. You well, know? also, you know, because oh, there, there are limits, you know what I mean? My ability to handle their limits is as good as, you know what I mean, my understanding my own. And that's really how I maneuver institutional limits that sometimes are heartbreaking. They can be devastating. Um, and I do, um, Dr. McCorkle mentioned you know, that I've had that experience so many times, this business of emoting that people see in us. There's so much... Uh, Unlike other people, women of color come with a presence. Whether we, that presence is something that we're bringing or that others perceive, it's constantly there. So I do think understanding the limits for me help me to function with the limits that other people put on us 
um, as an institution for Anna. For me, that's how I thought. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think self-care is extremely important uh, because universities are extremely competitive, demanding institutions. And as a woman of color, there's a tendency to always feel that you have to do better, overachieve, be, you know, strive to perfection, be a perfectionist in some ways. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, I, I uh, it's, it sounds very, it may sound frightened, you know, I tell all uh, the young faculty that I see around me that they have to take vacations. Um, you know, they say, so the women I work with say, well, how do you do it? I don't know how you do it. You're um, constantly being pressured. You're constantly having to make tough decisions and you're on email all the time. And so I try and it's difficult not to uh, send people email messages too, too late at night. I, I haven't been that successful at it, uh, but I, and I try to take vacations as well to tell them that they have to take time off. I think it's really important. Maybe to build on that, um, I, I am at the moment looking at uh, the resilience of revolutionary women in Egypt and their uh, challenges with the military's uh, um, leadership there since the beginning of the uh, January 25th revolution. And uh, I'm beginning to see that um, the necessity of looking at women in such contexts including the context that we're in as women of color um, of how vulnerable we are that we have, i feel that it is um important also to see our vulnerabilities and look at them at the same time as a strength um, um so that we can survive as a collective and because so far i don't have necessarily an administrative quote-unquote leadership position i am still um happily among the masses among the students and, and faculty and i am contemplating how if there is a position that i want to apply to what would that mean and how much it's going to sort of take me away from the base um so it, with the being cognizant of our vulnerabilities and our resilience and necessity to self-care i still want to be able to do that kind of horizontal leadership work so that we do change without before we get killed uh, because for for activists on the front line they're immediately you know up against the gun the the violence we take it as second wave and as more subtle in different structures so um this is um Part, this conversation is very helpful also to know that m many of us out there are um, thinking how, what is that inner conversation that is going on about our survival as women of color in leadership uh, arenas. Yeah. Thanks so much, Manal, for bringing up the issue of systemic violence, because I think that we don't um, necessarily talk about that enough. And especially, I think, in terms of leadership, like talking about women of color, first of all, let me know, any kind of scholarship on a women of color leadership is sent, right? Already, we already know that. But then on top of that, being able to talk about the way in which the system itself violates all aspects of our being um, and not being able to speak about that. And I think, you know, there's, there is research that has looked at um, how a lot of women of color deny systemic violence because they don't want to appear as weak. Like they want to appear as strong, they want to appear as they can make it through the system, that the system is not going to get them down. But that doesn't necessarily help us um, deal with the fact that the implications are real, whatever whatever that systemic violence might look like. Um, and so I think all of what you guys are saying about taking care of self, this is hugely important, um, especially actually when you look at some of the stats around women of color who face depression, anxiety, stress in the workplace, inevitably that is going to affect um, how you can move forward in your job. That has nothing to do with your competence. That, that's yeah. oftentimes a result of conditions that you're working in. So. And even when you bring up the idea of mental health and women of color, our mental health doesn't always look like um, what is yeah. in the DSM. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so oftentimes we we don't see ourselves as such or someone else may not see us as such because right. it doesn't manifest the way the DSM uh, states that depression or anxiety 
looks. And, and I think that often becomes uh, sometimes to our own detriment uh, because we are resilient. We're, we push through some things that maybe we should not push through. Yeah. Um, and so I think what I've learned uh, in, in my experiences is I've learned to know what I can and what I cannot do and what I will and what I will not do. Uh, I often, my kids laugh at me because I say I'm a box of Cheerios. I'm a little circle of oat. If you want snap, crackle and pop, you, that, I'm not that box of cereal because I'm not at that point where I'm willing to, you know, do a, a stage show and things like that anymore. I'm willing to to do what is important to me. Um, and I've gotten to that point in my career where I do not fear, you know, whether or not I will get to advance or not, um, because I will always be able to do what's important to me. Um, and so I think that for me, when uh, Kiara talked about self-care, I had to learn that um, because I saw what was happening is that you're in this rat race and you're on that wheel doing everything, you know, you're teaching classes, you're doing, re you're just trying to do everything. And you're finally going, wait a minute, I'm doing everything and I'm still on the wheel. So now I'm gonna get off the wheel. I'm gonna do what I wanna do, do it the way I like to do it and be okay with where I am. And so not necessarily seeing that I have to go up this ladder of leadership, but being able to use where I am to be a strong voice. And so I, I think that's important is recognizing what your limits are and what you will and will not do. What are you willing to do? And be okay with that and not feel that I have to do three more things because the person next to me is doing four more things. No, I'm gonna cheer you on. You go do five things. I'm happy with my one. I just wanted to add that um, like th these limits that were that you all spoke about so eloquently and they're all coming up against this whiteness is universal whether it's uh, whiteness is universal in, you know, mental health DSM or whiteness is universal in how people in my context are kind of responding in empathy and solidarity to the Muslim ban. Um, and it comes out in like a token statement, but then when actual solidarity, like signing the academic or joining the academic boycott against going to conferences in the US until all scholars who want to go to conferences in the US are able to go and how this normalized universal whiteness kinds of comes up and says, well, actually, we need to go, we need to go and engage, we need to keep the channels of communication open. Um, and it's, it's a, a limit that fighting back against and arguing against and explaining yourself over and over, it takes a lot of time. Um, and it attracts from other important things um, like Manel spoke about, Dr. Manel spoke about. Um, these things take a lot of time. And there is a lot of creativity that comes in responding to these things. Um, and like, as was mentioned before, um, there's a lot of resilience that one discovers in oneself and, and grit, but it does take a lot of time. Um, and, and this creativity doesn't come out of nowhere. It, it, it does take a lot out of one. And this is at a time when someone like myself, for instance, I, I am being evaluated according to things that aren't really related to work that one does in resisting this universal universalized whiteness so uh, yeah it's white supremacy all over again Never okay, thanks for thanks for pointing that out again Lucy because I think that people don't realize even the standards of engagement are actually we've, we've conditioned them in a particular paradigm right and we're not taught again it's about talking about that and exposing that being able to point that out to people but even that's exhausting right having to do that work constantly and yet necessary because i don't know if there's any way around it but i think it does it does bring up the piece of accountability right that women of color in leadership and and, and women of color in higher education and their experience and and what that experience is is not just the responsibility of us it's not just on us to make that experience better Right? Everybody's got to figure out what their accountability is, and it's not the same across the board. We, you know, we, we all have to step in differently uh, based on our positions and based on, on who we are. Um, so the next question I wanted to move on to was really, and I think actually, Lucy, you've given us a great segue into that, is really, you know, given the current political and social climate, both in the U.S. and Canada, and I mean, obviously in the U.S., it's been a, you know, there's, we've just, last few years have been um, a snowball of things. And that I think has also spilled over into Canada as well. Um, but 
how is that impacting the way that you do leadership implicitly or explicitly? You know, are there new expectations? Are there new kinds of conversations that are coming on a table? Or all of a sudden, are you, you know, finding yourself in a position where you're, you know, like your identity as a, as a woman, as a, as a racialized person is being highlighted in ways that are actually not very effective? May I speak for a second? Yeah, of course. Um, I think as, as um, um, Lucy was saying, this is a moment that suddenly everybody is looking at Islamophobia, and then we are with those who identify as Muslim or Arab, and it's, it becomes an opportunity for us some, in some cases to speak up and, and bring out our scholarship that, and our activism but, uh, to those who are asking to learn. But for me, I see that as a, as a moment of a serious intersectional feminism where the collaboration and alliances, solidarity with uh, the people of color, especially the Black Lives Matter movement, is really necessary. It's, it's um, important to see this mom that we are in a momentum, even though it sounds so crazy that we are, that there's a president who's a misogynistic white supremacist. And, and, and colonialist, imperialist, it is a moment that exposes this uh, power uh, that opens opportunities for us to stay and um, strengthen our alliance and solidarity. I do respond to some people who want to learn, but I tell them, I don't have all the time for you. You go and have, have, do your own learning. We've been waiting for this for so, too long. Yeah. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm like, Okay, let's stand in front of that mosque and this mosque in solidarity with Muslims, but where was your body when really women who identified it or visibly Muslim were getting harassed and killed on the streets of the U.S.? Where are you and every time the bomb is, is killing um, tens of people in Iraq and Afghanistan and now in Syria and, of course, Palestine? So it is about us uh, to... It is necessary for us to recognize that those solidarities, I'm sorry, those solidarities have to, we have to recognize that we've had them all along and they are even more important right now to keep intact because they, you know, the powers are going to try to break them down, whether they can see the leaders or they can see the patterns, they are going to try to break them down. And I think this is where, in this context, in this moment, where I want and I am putting my uh, energy. Um, Manel, one of the things I hear you saying also is that we need to push beyond liberal niceness, right? So it's it's nice. Okay, yeah, you want to understand, great, you know, but and I think Lucy was referring to this as well, but really we, the kind of solidarity that we're asking for pe from people is really for them to step in, really step in and be, be with communities side by side and be willing to be vulnerable and take those risks that communities of color have been taking for a long time and that now are taking, I think, even greater risks and have to. I, I agree with Manal that I think the election of this year really brought to light for whites what the rest of us have been experiencing. And and it was, I mean, people are like, why are you not so upset? Because this has been my narrative since I've been on this earth. And now you are seeing what we have to deal with day in and day out. Uh, and I do agree with Manal that I don't want your sympathy. That doesn't help me. Uh, I appreciate it, but what I need is for you to use your voice and your privilege to help me change this. Um, and so I, I think the election, you know, as Americans, we had this false sense that we had moved to this post-racial or this kumbaya period. And it, it we never had, It's it's we had a kind of a, a false existence. And I think this election showed there is still a lot of hate in our world. Um, and we can't be complacent uh, about addressing it. Um, and so I think now it becomes everyone's responsibility, not just responsibility of those of us who are of color, who do experience discrimination, but it becomes all of our responsibility because we each will end up um, suffering if we don't do something about it. So even a white supremacist is not gonna come out on top if we don't address this. And so I think that's what this election um, has taught us or should have taught us is that we're all in this together. Um, and this is the time that we either choose to use all of our power and our privilege to deal with this or we suffer the consequences. 
Candy, so in your, in your leadership position, are you finding that that's a conversation that's being had or that you can have? Uh, it is a conversation I am having with students. Uh, it is a conversation I am having with faculty. Um, uh, uh, some of our faculty are very liberal um, and their ideas of, you know, this is an outrage. Yes, it is, but what are we going to do about it? And again, that goes back to, you know, they're outraged by it and they're upset by it, but I need you to turn that into action, um, not just, you know, I'm wounded. Okay, lick your wounds, get a Band-Aid. Now we need to come up with how are we going to respond to this? And so it is a conversation having with students um, and having with faculty uh, because it, Again, being on a predominantly white campus, we have students who they're just, they're paralyzed. They're going, oh my gosh, I can't believe this. Because they're now seeing firsthand what someone like me has seen firsthand all of her life. And they're not equipped to deal with it. I'm equipped to deal with it because it's been my life. And so helping them understand how you work through something like this mm -hmm. and what your response is. Do I have all the answers? No. But I think it is a great time now because we've put us all kind of on an equal footing that, you know, people begin to see if I don't respond, I, I suffer the same consequence. My privilege is no longer as powerful as it once was. And so. Yeah, and just thank you so much for raising that point because I just think that the other, the, the other piece I just wanted to mention around that is that even amongst women of color, you know, our power and our privilege is different. <laughs> so recognizing how we differently need to step in, I think, is also really an important part of that conversation as well, um, and one that I think that needs to be had. Sorry, Lucy, you were going to say I something? Yeah, I was going to say, like, building on what Dr. McCorkle said, um, that this, this current moment is making it easier to have conversations um, because um, people are more aware now of how their privilege was really empty, or for some people, um, their aspirational or maybe uh, imagined privilege was, was not anything of substance to begin with. And it's easier to have conversations around, for example, how Islamophobia was never really a phobia. It was never really about education or just representation, even though those were parts of it. But Islamophobia was always about racism that was linked to other racisms like anti-blackness. Um, and that when you kind of recognize what anti-Muslim racism or Islam racism, some people call it, then you can start to think beyond educating um, white people all the time and explaining yourself to them over and over and think, oh, yeah, that's one piece, but that's not the only piece. We need to also think about solidarity with other marginalized groups and having these conversations and explaining racism in this way is, is people are more open to hearing that right now. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. um, the, the term yeah. homophobia just drives me crazy because everyone thinks like it's an issue of mental health. Like somebody had an experience with a hairy spider when they were young and they're going to go and get some you know cognitive behavioral therapy and they'll be cured of it it's not an issue of mental health it's an issue of racism and representation is one part of that but to describe it as a phobia doesn't account for all of it and thank you and and i think that that's something also that Muslims are learning that that language as well, right? Yeah, you see, like, very, I, very definitely. Yep. Yeah, that we, that the communities that are Muslim or Arab are also figuring out that we need to also be articulating that in a way that describes it in real terms. Right. You know, I was thinking as I'm listening to everyone that for, for me, when I when I think about the current political and social climate, I think about capital. I see it as capital. I see it as an opportunity to crush the higher system kind of as it stands, in the sense that I really believe higher ed has to go through a complete restructuring. That I believe it has to come down as we understand it currently and be rebuilt. And I think that it will be um, over the course of time. But one of the main reasons is, and, and I've heard it in each of, of the comments um, the lady just pointed out, but it's all it's, it's solidarity, the need for unity. It doesn't just exist within institutions and, and communities. You know, it's a global human desire, unity, right? It's something that will take over, I believe, higher ed. Um, and how do I usher that unity along, that solidarity along? Um, 
you know, one of the things I'm learning or I'm learning from the millennials is, you know, and, and Dr. McCook touched on it earlier, you know, is the idea that I don't have to be labeled and be a part of a structure in a system and, you know, I don't have to keep living a box that we've all, you know, the matrix that we've all awakened to now and we see very clearly. We don't have to keep living in the matrix. Um, and I think that's a part of becoming global is saying this is what I'm willing to do, right? This is what I will do. This is what I won't do. These are my limits. And my... That means stepping out of the traditional the traditional context of self, of being a woman, of being a black woman, of being an educated black woman, of being, you know, whatever classification you want to throw on there. It's a sense of really becoming global, a globalized human being, a global citizen. Uh, I think, for me, that political and social climate, that's a part of tearing down pirate and redesigning it to become global. And really, humanitarian in this approach, which it has not been, you know, as um, you, see, you pointed out, you know, these institutions, this is flat out racism. There's no way around it, right? I mean, these are isms. And we do have language, I think, that we, we you know, it's like the word diversity. I know you and I have talked about it a lot. You know, it's, it's a word now that's just so, and, you know, the language just isn't enough to encompass all of the things, you know. So I, I just find that, that in terms of, you know, politics and social issues, that is my opportunity as a woman of color to really develop higher ed in the way that I don't have power to do it, but that the society and the world has the power to do, which also gives me you know, the ability to step back. It's not me. I can use the leverage of humanity to change this system. And that's how I see it. And I try to approach my leadership, you know, as, as jumping on that momentum. And it's not me. It's not me. This is what the world is asking for, you know. Um, I think that's important. You have the backing of the world. You have the backing of people and women everywhere and people everywhere and and I think, you know, that connectedness, that solidarity is something that we can really capitalize on in terms of our work as leaders of color. I really do believe that. I, I agree. I think the, the alliances and the, the solidarity and the networks of support have uh, really come to the fore uh, recently in, in, in the face of uh, political, recent uh, political events. Uh, I think that um, it's also made me aware of the shifting, uh, the shifting meaning of uh, race for me, uh, because you know there was a time in which uh, my my family and I were targets, direct targets of racism, and then I find myself on a panel, uh, public panel, with uh, a number of other women who would identify as white, um, and then someone in the audience uh, said, "Well, uh, what's there's something wrong with this panel because there's not one person of color on it. Um, and I was sitting there on stage and, uh, you know, it made me realize, well, they don't even, that's a real problem. <laughs> that's uh, uh, offensive in some way, in, in many ways. Uh, they don't see me as a racialized, visibly racialized person. And um, so, so this is a time when I can support uh, people who are um, experiencing uh, much more blatant discrimination, um, you know, who are feeling much more strongly the effects of social injustice. Um, so that kind of solidarity is really important. And, and I think as Chiara had mentioned as well, um, it's a time when words aren't enough. And I think that's the challenge of the time to go beyond the rhetoric, because now, uh, especially, there's a lot of rhetoric. And um, I think we're, uh, many of us are in a position of um, influence and, certain, and a position of some authority to uh, actually make changes, to, do, to do, take, take uh, steps to go beyond the words. Thank you, Pam. I mean, I, I guess this kind of leads us to the, the final question, uh, which is, 
You know, as um, there's this push, to, there is a push, I think, on many institutions now to bring in more people of color into leadership positions, into administrative positions, um, into even faculty positions. I mean, the extent to which that's real uh, commitment or not is, is questionable. But I think, you know, as, as, the, as more of this is going to happen, there's more conversation about this and perhaps more policy that supports that. You know, what is your, what are your words of wisdom uh, to other women of color that want to be in leadership positions within academia, within higher education institutions? What do they, you know, if you had to, you know, come up with a few things that they should be aware of or that, you know, that they need to put in their toolbox, what would that be? I say always to first and foremost, take care of yourself. And when I say that, I mean, define for yourself what taking care of me is. And that should, for me, it includes your career and really focusing and honing on what you want. Do you want to be a university president? Do you want to be a provost? Do you want to be a faculty member, a tenured? What do you, you know, what's the, what's the goal? Um, and then how do you want to get there? What experiences do you want to have to get there? But taking care of yourself means envisioning the woman that you want to become, the legacy you want to leave as well as taking care of your physical self, your spiritual self, your emotional self, right? So I say first and foremost, take care of yourself, which encompasses all of those things. And then the second piece for me is then keeping your eyes on the track. You know, my father used to tell us that when we were kids, we're like, yeah, we know that, keep your eyes on. I could not understand that more today, you know, from first hand experiences, you know, you need to keep your eyes on the prize. When these barriers come up, when, when when it gets hard and when you get tired and when, you know, you really sometimes want to give up or are feeling challenged, I think, keep, what do you do to keep your eyes on the prize? What do you do to re-center yourself, to refocus quickly and keep moving? How do you live in that resilience? And that's part of when we talk about resilience earlier. I do think as you grow, you grow you can grow gracefully or not so gracefully into your resilience. So uh, for me, I really would tell women to keep their eyes on the prize and develop personal habits and characteristics that help you recenter on your pride as you're going through your life and your career. And then lastly, I would say to reach out and build a network. I really... You know, we've learned from a young age, you know, girls are patty and don't do this and all those stereotypes. It's garbage. Um, I believe it's garbage. I just tell young people, we see it as we all do in, in the colleges and universities today. There's still a lot of that um, sexist garbage, right, going around. So fighting the sexism, right, and I think that's important and build, you know, a group, a network of people you can trust and talk to. Those will be the two pieces I've been I agree. And one of the, the best advices I could give along with that is to find mentors, uh, people who are going to help you refocus, people who are going to be honest with you. Uh, and I think the, the best advice I have is find your voice and own it. Um, do not allow someone else to write your narrative or tell you what it is. Find your voice, own your voice, and realize that voice has value and teach others how to value that voice. That's not just your spoken voice, but that's just who you are, learning how to own it and be okay with it. And chart your own path. Don't assume you have to follow what someone else has done. It worked for them, it may not work for you. And so figuring out who you are, as Chiara, Chiara said, and own it, own that voice. That's, that's really interesting because I was thinking the exact same things. I mean, I think mentorship is really important. I think it's very rewarding uh, to mentor and really important to uh, have mentors, whether they be peers or you know, people who are a senior to you in the university or community and uh, friendship is, is extremely important. You know, the people you, know, you can trust. Um, and I think similar to having your own voice charting your own path, authenticity uh, is, is uh, something that I really value. And I think um, you know, it's, it's key uh, to leadership, to strong leadership and to being true to yourself. 
And then I would say also be be smart, be strategic. Um, I, I think you can't win every battle. Choose your battles carefully, um, and um, know that you're not always going to be right as well. Um, and I think it's more important to be fair and just, and think about the outcome that you want rather than proving that you're right. I would just, um, I, I, I agree with everything that's been said, of course, and I, one of the most surprising things for me is how these relationships and how these friendships that are supporting me has really been the sweetest part of the journey so far and, and so, so very unexpected to me. Um, and I'd also just add to that, like constantly checking my intention, constantly checking the intentionality of everything I do so that my ego doesn't, oh, it inevitably does get sometimes mixed up with my intentionality and having good friends who can call me out on that and say, you really need to think why you're doing this. Are you doing it because you think you actually have something to contribute or because it's a platform for your ego? Um, and um, yeah, <laughs> friendships and relationships are definitely the sweetest part of this. I'll add to mentors, friendships, uh, the alliances uh, around that have been in the context you are in for longer and they know how to navigate and they see the landscape uh, pretty uh, clearly and uh, to be also about around visionaries and creators it's because we sometimes perhaps get stuck into being very linear in the way we want to get to um, uh, the outcomes that uh, in our where we are, but I think being around visionaries and creators will open more spaces of healing and imagining where we're heading and how we can get there. Yeah, I mean, I guess I want to ask one more question, if that's okay, because we have five more minutes. But um, and the last question was really this, and I, this has come up in a lot of the leadership um, literature as well, as particularly around women of color, is really, really the importance of mentorship. So, what do you do in a context where? you don't have other of color mentors. You find them. <laughs> they don't have to be in the immediate yeah. context. Yeah. They can be community. Uh, they don't have to be in the environment you're in per se. Um, I often, I happen to find mentors who were not people I would have thought as mentors. Uh, when I first started, I had uh, three older white male uh, professors who were pretty much institutions in and of themselves at the institution, but they wanted change. And so uh, they were very uh, gracious in fighting the battles as I set off the landmines um, so that I could continue to do that. They were my buffer. Um, and so sometimes also learning that it may not always come from another woman of color or a person of color but finding people who are true to what it is you're doing um, and being willing to, to see that person who doesn't look like you doesn't mean that they don't have something to contribute. So I think mentors are there for different reasons. And so I have mentors who are women of color who can help me with that recharging I need or that refocusing. But when it comes to fighting certain battles, there are other people who have a bit more power that they can be a, a greater uh, resource or help. So I think being broader in how you look for mentors and not being so narrow and that it has to be someone like me. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's really critical. I, I actually tell people you should not have all women of color or all people of color as mentors. I mean, because again, you're, you know, you're kind of limiting like, you know, Candy points out, you're limiting, you know, the possibilities of, of what you could learn. If there's a human being that's out there willing to help you develop your authenticity, then that's the person you want to cling on to, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I tell people, if you're in a place that doesn't have any people of color, I would seek out, you know, mentors there. And then you should always have a larger network of people of color and not, you know, of all backgrounds that you can go to outside of the environment. Um, but I would say to be very intentional about developing, because see also that's a part of the reciprocal teaching and learning that has to take place. You know, how can you influence an institution if you're like, oh, there's nobody here of color that can mentor me, so I better go. Then you're not at all engaging with that. You know, that's what changing community is, changing climate. You have to engage in consultation and in kind of dialogue and relationships. 
to really advance change in my perception. So I would say intentionally in a situation like that, seek out people there, you know, yeah, I would as well as, you know, your, your traditional network. <laughs> Uh, Sorry, Tim. No, I agree. I think you know, in in a university, there are certain there are. I mean, we know that there aren't all that many uh, women of color, people of color, um, certainly not in positions of formal leadership, and that's one of the reasons uh, many of my mentors are uh, are not of, of color. Um, so many of them are white men. And I have uh, likewise uh, different mentors for different purposes, but many of them, I mean, they're good people and they care about me and I have a good rapport with them and respect them. And that's what's really important. And they know how to navigate uh, the system and to get things done. Uh, that's important. There are other uh, women of color, uh, my good friends, and they get it. And, in, in, um, you know, we have certain shared in jokes, uh, you know, we go to a conference in a very homogeneous area and we take count of the number of uh, black women who are there. One of my close friends is a, uh, an African Canadian woman and uh, she just does needs to send me the number and I know what she's talking about, Let's say, uh, two. And, um, you know, we get it. We, we uh, have a shared experience. But, uh, they don't all have to be uh, the same as me. And so, Ema, just, just really, really quick, I just want to point out that I know that we, for people who are listening, it's really important that people understand that you can't assume that because people are of color either, that they are willing to develop you or support your 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 growth and development and authenticity. I mean, some, there are so many layered issues that, you know, there are many people who are not where we are, right, in this conversation. Um, there are issues for me, for example, in the fall when we had the protest, I mean, there were a lot of people on campus that said I wasn't black enough to represent, yet the institution's like, she's our only senior black person, so we're using her, right? But people never thought about that dichotomy for me. You know, I'm the only black senior administrator there, so why would anybody think of that? But for me, that was a real experience. And when I shared that with the present provost, they were like, whoa, we never even thought of that. So I think it's important for people to know that just because somebody may look or identify that, again, that intersectionality that we talked about early on, people don't get. And I see that as one of my major responsibilities is to help develop people's concept of intersectionality and how you really relate to human beings. You can't just look at this one piece and think that you understand who they are or where they're going and how you can help them. Yeah, and I think the system also, unfortunately, sets it up in such a way that a lot of women of color do feel like they're in sort of a power play, you know? Um, and that's also, being a patriarchal system, that's also really difficult. So I think that, thank you for pointing that out, Kiara, for sure. Manal or Lucy, did you want to add anything? Last thought? I just want to add one more thing that I've read um, um, recently that we need to not only reconceptualize as everybody expressed the the notion of mentorship but to rename it as femtorship mm. <laughs> thank you for that <laughs> yeah and i uh, just agree with everybody <laughs> i think it's a really good note to end it. i couldn't add anything to femtorship <laughs> Fabulous. Well, I want to thank all of you for um, Dr. McCorkle, Dr. Dr. Sugerman, Dr. Hamza, Dr. Hensley, and to be Dr. El Sheriff. Thank you all so much for coming on and sharing so generously and openly your experiences and your insights. Um, like I said, you are the first, the few, and the only, and it mm -hmm. is an absolute privilege, absolute privilege to be able to speak to you today and for you to give us so much to walk away with. So we hope the conversation continues and we look forward to more of them with all of you. Thank you, Salima, for the opportunity. Also Thank for, you all. You know, each one of you just a little bit. It has been enjoyable. Yes, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I look forward, uh, Salima, to getting the uh, files and CVs because I'd like to connect with some folks. Like, Candy, we're not far from one another. No. Not at all. So we have to connect. And, and I'm an alum of EMU. 
Are you? Okay, so I'll call you. I'll get this stuff. <laughs> okay. All right. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.